Hey everyone, a big welcome to the Forge Ahead Show, hosted by me, Nick Elston, inspirational speaker, creator of unique mental health engagement strategies, a transformational speaking coach, and a mentor to have in your corner. The Forge Ahead Show brings you the storytellers, the influencers, the people who have gone from adversity to excitement, forging something better, something beautiful, something powerful. So stay tuned. Dive in and be inspired by today's very special guest. Hey everyone and a big welcome back to the Forge Ahead Show, Season 2, Episode 10. I've got it right again, This is I'm, not, I'm on a roll. Um, and today I've got an amazing guest to bring you, uh, somebody kind of who's paths I've crossed with over the past year, so lockdown has been a great year from that point of view, um, and it's Ali Marchand. Big round of applause for Ali. Hey! Thanks so much for having me here, Nick. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Very good. Very good, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a busy old time, but I'm taking my own advice. You may find that it's so much harder to take your own advice than it is to actually take somebody else's. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's always the hardest. <laughs> Far <laughs> easier to tell people what to do when it is to do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, where should we begin with this? This is really cool. So you are coming to us from the US via Zurich, or is it the other way around? No, you are in Zurich now, and you're originally from the US. Yeah. Firstly, how did that happen? <laughs> that is a funny story, actually. So I'm originally from Colorado, which is right in the middle of the US, and I went to university in California. And I studied business because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I did what everybody does and just picked business in general. Um, and I found that I quite liked my finance classes. Like I liked math. I liked the certainty of numbers. And my senior year, so my final year at university, one of my professors announced to the class that he was putting on an investment conference in Las Vegas. And he really wanted some students to join. So he offered a scholarship. It wasn't like a, a lot of money, but it was to cover the flights, the hotel, um, whatever you wanted to eat there. So it was like a free weekend in Vegas, if you will, to a 21 year old. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and surprisingly, not very many people applied for it. Um, I'm not sure, the investment conference itself didn't sound like that exciting, but I was a graduating senior. I wanted to find a job. Um, I knew that there would be maybe some people from Wall Street there or some big banks. So I was going in with the mindset that um, it's a good networking opportunity, if nothing else. Right. So I went to this investment conference in Las Vegas and I didn't end up going to so many of the speakers, but I did go to this one guy who was talking about international diversification. So he was talking to American investors on how to kind of invest abroad in other currencies and, and just kind of do that with your investment profile portfolios. And I thought that was so interesting. And I actually then ended up meeting him on the elevator on the way down to the conference the very last day. And I kid you not when I say it was an elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> it truly really was. Yeah, he just started talking to me. He was like, he saw that I was a student. So he was curious, like what school I went to, what I was studying. And I was very bold. And I just flat out said, Hey, you know, I've really been looking to travel abroad. I am really interested in working abroad. And I love finance investments, like, you know, stuff that you were talking about. And I brought up specific topics that I had heard him talk about. And um, so basically, from there, we continued the conversation, um, I emailed him a bunch of times asking him directly for an opportunity or an internship to come abroad. And basically, four weeks later, I packed my bags and I was flying off to Zurich, Switzerland, which I had no idea where it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so, I've, I've made some notes while you're talking because as avid listeners and watchers of the show will know that I go off down tangents and rabbit holes and sometimes there's no coming back so I need to rein it in by making a few notes sometimes so yeah. there are things I'm going to come back to but where does that lead you to where you are now and, and tell everybody like kind of what you do what you do now yeah so right now I am the co-founder CEO of a digital marketing company 
And I bet right now a lot of people are like, what? <laughs> Didn't she just say she liked finance? Um, what happened there? So essentially what happened is I started working in a small wealth management company in Zurich. And I noticed right away that there was a big difference in the um, kind of what companies did in the US and what companies were doing in Switzerland. And in general, like the Swiss culture is very different from the American culture um, in America, in the US, we're much louder. And um, we're kind of, I don't want to say more transparent, but we don't care as much about like what we say and who we say it to and, you know, things like that. And in Switzerland, people are very mindful about what they say, um, what kind of information they share. And this was the same for companies. And so what I was finding was that um, private banks, asset managers, wealth managers, they were, they didn't exist online. And this was in 2017. And I came over here and I was like, what do you mean you don't have a LinkedIn profile? And what do you mean your website is like just one page and you can't even click, click to email or get in touch? Like, I was just so confused with all of that. And um, so I worked at this wealth management company for about three years. And I really, how this happened was just talking about my ideas. Like I encourage everybody to just talk to as many people about their ideas because I guarantee that's, that's your mind's way of fitting pieces together. So that's your, that's your mind's way of being like, okay, we're at point A, we want to get to point B. And the more you talk about it, the more your mind is like, okay, this is how we're going to get there. Right. So um, I was talking to so many people and I got invited to pitch basically what I was talking about, which was why it was important to be active online. And it wasn't really a pitch because I didn't have a company. I didn't have a business. I didn't have a business plan. Um, but I went into this, this conference room full of people and I just started talking. I said, hey, this is how you can get clients online. This is how the next generation is spending their time. This is how you can optimize your results or your leads or whatever. And it turned out there was a CEO in that room, um, another CEO in that room and another entrepreneur. So three people came up to me after that and was like, you're hired. <laughs> and that's how my marketing business started. So I run a marketing business for financial services now full time. And I just kind of help them learn how to talk to the next generation of investors, learn how to talk to more diverse investors, um, change their way of communication so that they're more inclusive, really make a name for themselves on the online world. Mm. And why the name Impressum? Where did that come from? Oh, I love that you asked that. Um, so like I just mentioned, we, we are doing digital marketing for financial services. And I think right now there's a big disconnect in financial services. So you have what the investors and the portfolio managers and you have what they want to want to tell people and then you have what the investors want to hear and next generation investors want to hear about sustainability they want to hear about transparency they want to hear about diversity and so we want to come in and help the old school finance people or just financial professionals impress them so impress the next nice. generation of i investors. see what you did there <laughs> 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 Um, okay, so where should we go first? Okay, so I would say you mentioned it already. Actually, it was a thing I made a note of. It's really, quite, really cool that when you first approached a guy in the lift, that's not a British way to do things. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Absolutely, but yeah. there is certainly, and the more I've worked in the US, the more I've, I've kind of noticed if there's an opportunity, you go for it. There's no filter in between. And 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 like I said, through Switzerland, that kind of European mentality far more reserved, uh, I guess, more of a traditionally uh, not very open uh, society or as open society. These are all generalisms, of course. Yeah. Um, so how, how was that for you? For somebody who was inclined to be the person that went for that opportunity in the lift, to be in an environment where potentially it may have been frowned on to be as open? Yeah, that is another great question. So how was it for me coming from this open no rules, loud American society <laughs> to quite the opposite in yeah. Swiss culture. And I think um, from what I know, the UK is like right in the middle of the two. So definitely I've, I've heard people say they're not as open and direct as Americans are, um, but I don't think that you guys are quite as reserved as the Swiss. So it's, it's, okay, it's interesting. one extreme to yeah. the other. Um, <laughs> And I can't tell you the first year that I moved to Switzerland, I was 22 
I had just graduated from, from university. Um, I was really used to friends and family all around me. I've generally been a pretty outgoing person. I was not worried in the slightest. I had zero concern with how it was going to be to make friends or, you know, what I was going to do in my off time or, you know, how I would um, learn about the culture or kind of insert myself in the, in the culture. Right. And that was a really rude awakening. I mean, really like when I got here after the first, I think three months or so, and I still didn't have one friend here, I looked up and I was like, then I started to question myself. I started to say, okay, what's wrong with me? Because I wasn't expecting this. And I didn't take the time to really learn about the culture I was coming into and things like that. So it was um, the first year that I moved here was a lot of getting to know myself. It was the most out of my comfort zone that I've ever been in my entire life. I can tell you that I, uh, even though I've learned so much, and I'm so proud of but what that did for me and where I am now, I honestly wouldn't wish that year on my worst enemy. It yeah. was it was a really, really harsh awakening. I imagine that must have been really tough. I mean, the on the flip side, obviously it's been your selling point as well, that you're doing things that other people aren't. And that's that's an amazing thing. It's a unique selling point, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. In terms of languages, is it something that you, are you fluent in, in multiple languages or is it something, again, you've had to pick up? Or? Yeah, so Switzerland has, it's, it's a tiny country, but they have four languages, um, German, Italian, um, French, and Romance. Unfortunately, I didn't know any of the four. I, learn, I live in the German part of Switzerland and it's not even high German. It's not even the German you learn in school. It's a special kind of German a <laughs> dialect <laughs> that you cannot learn, except it's just like spoken. Um, it's Swiss German. And that was um, another really hard part. I mean, so I grew up, I speak Spanish. Yeah. Um, and I thought that would always help me. My parents were always like, you are bilingual. You speak two languages. You can do anything in the world. It didn't help me here in Switzerland. <laughs> and um, learning the language has just been really that's been a huge challenge as well. Um, mm. Fitting fitting the language school into my schedule, really making an effort to prioritize and push myself to learn it because it's not school telling me to learn it. It's not my job telling me to learn it, but it is something that you have to do if you live in a different culture, right? You have to learn yeah, their absolutely. language. So that has also been um, a huge challenge for, for living here. I can imagine. You mentioned being away from friends and family initially, and obviously that took some, some time, some adjustment your end and I guess their end as well I mean that's that's a whole different maybe that's a whole different conversation but over the past 14 months with things like the pandemic and lockdown it's kind of kind of history repeating itself I guess for you isn't it because it's kind of uh taken away even those opportunities that were available to make new friendships and that kind of stuff make new relationships yeah that is a great point and I can't even tell you how happy I am that I didn't come to Switzerland during the pandemic that I was here for a few years before the pandemic that I actually have met people now and had people to reach out to um, because I can't imagine how much worse I would have felt or like how stuck I would have felt in the pandemic where you couldn't go outside you couldn't meet people meeting people online is just kind of so surface level. And yeah. so, I mean, yeah, that's completely true. I'm, I feel very lucky to have already met people that I really consider close friends and that I had to talk to and kind of get me through the pandemic. Absolutely. And from a business perspective, has that been able to thrive still during this period? Or is it something that's just looks different now? That's a funny question, actually, because when we started this, of course, we had no idea that a global pandemic was coming. And we started right before the pandemic hit. Wow. Uh, it, it was brilliant timing. Couldn't have planned it better. <laughs> um, but since we are doing digital marketing and teaching people how to actually do their business and grow their business without being in the office, without meeting new clients, it kind of has helped us in a weird way. It kind of has woken everybody up. And now instead of convincing people that digital marketing or social media or websites are important, people are now asking us, okay, we know that's important. Skip to the next part. How can you help us? So it actually has eliminated a step in the sales process for us and kind of helped. 
That, that's fascinating. I, I used to be uh, absolutely resonate with that. I used to be head of partnerships for a, a software company that specialised in electronic signatures. So again, uh, the, the founder, Ollie, a friend of mine, he said exactly the same thing. It's kind of sped along that process of having to get used to the new normal in terms of document signing, for example, as opposed yeah. to pen on paper. So yeah, absolutely. And that's great to hear, actually. It's good to know. So a lot of the a lot of the people listening and watching this at the moment um, are here because they have a, a passion for positive mental health and things like personal development and stuff. Now, one thing I'm really keen to get your take on is that that kind of relationship between things like social media, visibility and overwhelm, and it's linked to mental health and how we feel. So even, I guess, at its worst, things like doom scrolling, where you're scrolling through feeds, it makes you feel bad. Um, but also sometimes you have trolling experiences. Um, what's your kind of take on that relationship between mental health and, and social media and visibility? Yeah, I mean, just from a, a personal standpoint, I can absolutely relate to people how social media has impacted our personal mental health. I mean, it's crazy, right? You you used to be able to go out and meet friends and if, so, if somebody said something bad about you or behind your back, maybe it would come through the grapevine, maybe it would be in person, but you know, you had you had just certain parameters for when that could come. Now all of a sudden it's it's always on. You can anytime you want pick up your phone and go to a, a social platform. You can, you know, post something and leave it out for everyone to see or to judge. And I can tell you, like, I started posting on my personal account much more since I've started the business because it's a better way to make connections with someone personal than a business. And I have absolutely encountered trolls and people who, wow, really? uh, oh my gosh, yeah, especially, actually, I can tell you, I actually started trying to use TikTok. Um, I know it sounds like it's for the younger people, but it's a growing platform for for also us millennials and, and older yeah. people as well. And um, I just love that it has flipped the, the algorithm. So it doesn't let you just talk to people who follow you. It lets you talk to its entire space and whoever is interested in your topic will kind yeah. of have the ability to see your post. So I like the idea of the platform. Um, but talk about an addiction. Don't don't go, don't go on that app. If not you don't. for somebody with an obsessive personality, then I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really dangerous. Um, but when I first started posting there, even about my story about coming over from the U.S. to Switzerland, um, about what I encountered in the financial industry, like you know things that I saw that I didn't like. Um, people are so harsh when they're hiding behind a screen. I mean, right. really, like I encountered so many people who were like go back to third world country America, like just go back to like, nobody wants you here. Stuff that, you know, wow. I know when I'm saying it now, I'm like, okay, but Ali, that shouldn't have affected you that much because you don't know these people and they're just kind of spitballing and they don't even really like want, like got, they didn't have the chance to get to know you at all. So why should this affect you that much? But when you're reading those words, it does. It really yourself, does. it's really harsh, right? So I think what, what I would tell people and what I try to tell myself is to keep some boundaries alive in this always on world. Like even though I work in digital marketing, I think having parameters to how much time I spend on one social media site yeah. um, and just making sure you have that offline time because yeah. you have to prioritize it now because otherwise we're always on our computers or our phone phones. Um, so it's important to just really maintain those healthy boundaries for yourself and mm. kind of just, if you know them, stick to them. I can tell you that I have a hard time sticking to mine, but I really make it an effort, like shut down my phone at 9 PM. Um, don't spend more than an hour on Instagram, just things like that really help. That's really cool. Thank you. I mean, you say uh, our paths crossed through initially through, uh, next gen, uh, financial planning, uh, platform that. We were both brought in on different events to speakers, guest speakers, and to contribute and stuff. And and then you came to my speaking academy and shared amazing stuff for your stories as well. Um, so our paths crossed through this kind of concept, I guess, of financial well-being, uh, the financial planning community. Uh, that's predominantly where you work in that space. Let's. I think it's still fair to say, even though it's changing culturally, traditionally it's one of the last bastions of traditional business so we think of financial planners as predominantly male white gray suited and booted 
Um, that is changing, but how have your experiences been over your career within this space? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I was working in financial services, so in wealth management, um, I think I was I was very naive, obviously, in very many part, like spaces when I first started working, right? I wasn't ready for the change of culture, wasn't ready to live alone, I wasn't ready to make friends, and I wasn't ready to face um, the kind of things that you hear about working in a corporate environment, like, oh, you're a woman, beware of this and this and this, and, you know, beware of the pay gap and um, not being heard in a room and, and things like that. I've heard those stories before, but it wasn't until I was working in a corporate environment that I was like, oh, these are real. These are not wow. just stories that yeah. you kind of hear about. Um, so, but I think that was a very important thing for me to see and witness firsthand because it has become one of my most important values is just kind of making everybody's voice heard. And not only that, bringing up chairs to the table. So not only allowing people who want to talk to talk, but really inviting everybody to talk and like get an even um, kind of the even power in the words that they share. And so my experiences working in wealth management have really influenced how I'm running my own business. And while I did notice so many things that needed to be fixed, I really do feel like we're moving in a positive direction. So mm -hmm. I really am a person who likes to focus on the positive instead of dwelling on the negative. And if there is negative, what can we do to fix that instead of sitting around and saying, oh, this is wrong. It's so wrong. Okay. Yeah we've acknowledged that it's wrong. What can we do to now improve it and fix it and, you know, make it better for the next generation. Right. So Absolutely. Um, I think I, I really have noticed and now working with next gen. Um, I mean, I absolutely adore that community. And I think there's such a great diversity of voices that you hear on that platform. And I think that's true in general. And I, and I really think um, it's not only, I, so I, really want to get more women investing and more women kind of taking part in the financial industry on both ends on becoming financial planners and having the dream to work in finance and taking control of their finances and investing and taking that initiative. Um, and I think they both go hand in hand because when women in, who want to invest see women who are financial planners, they connect to them more Then they have more trust and they can see themselves in them. Right. And yeah. And younger financial or younger women, if they see more women in the field, then they see themselves in becoming that. And so exactly. it's all along this wheel. And I think it's moving. Maybe it's moving too slow, but it is going in the right direction. And I think that's a, a huge part of why I want to do what I do, because it's about changing the conversations. So, so finance was built by white males for white males, of course, like women couldn't even have their own bank account when the whole banking industry got started. So I understand why these like kind of conversations are in place that are so that aren't resonating with women. I'm, of course, they're not. This industry wasn't built for you. But if we open up those conversations and we start talking more about values, more start, start talking more about family or goals or, you know, different things than just like hard profits, risk um, tolerance, and like just kind of the harder stuff, I think we can change both sides of mm. the industry. So yeah, that's that's a long-winded answer of saying, I think things are for the better. <laughs> I love your passion around this. I was reading through your LinkedIn bio earlier on, and it, even that was, it was more like a mission statement than the bio. It was great. It, was just, it just kind of really sh showed your your cause and you champion that. And to use kind of like a sporting term, that you want to leave that shirt stronger than you found it. And I think that's a really important thing because also it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. Like you said, you lead the way, you forge that path. Um, yeah, I love that. That's really cool. The, um, I guess from a transactional point of view, I mean, it does certainly help having a 4D perspective as somebody from that industry working in that industry. I know with things like marketing and, and social media for sure, and there's quite a lot, unless it's changed, because I've not had this conversation for a few years, there's quite a lot of regulatory stuff about what, people in the financial space can and cannot post. Is that right still? Yeah. And that is the number one fear that I hear from 
okay. financial planners or financial entrepreneurs is um, compliance regulations, fear of, you know, talking about something that they're not allowed to talk about. Um, and what I have found, um, so I'm not a professional in compliance or anything like that, but I have found that the regulations aren't as strict as people think that they are. So the regulations are in place, um, at least in the US, so that you don't get sued for suggesting someone buy something and then they lose a lot of money. And then they're like, hey, it was their fault because they posted that this is a good investment and it's not. And I lost my life savings. So that is what the um, regulation agencies and things are trying to avoid. But in terms of making things more transparent, you have so many topics that you're allowed to talk about. And I think that that is something that financial professionals kind of miss when they think of marketing. They think of just selling their services or promoting them or talking about their investment philosophy or, or things like yeah. that. And what I always want them to talk about and want them to realize is that it's not just about the investment philosophy or their business. It's about, you know, the stories, like you always say, it's about the stories, why are they, why they're doing what they're doing, how they can change somebody's life. What has happened for a past client that they've been so inspired by um, what goals they could achieve when they work with a financial planner, what exactly it looks like to look, work with a financial planner, because the biggest problem with, people being hesitant to work with financial professionals is a mistrust in the financial industry and confusion. Like they just don't understand how they can work with them or why they should work with them or, you know, how it would help them. And so if you demystify that and you make it more transparent without telling people like buy this stock or something like that, it is 100% possible to be a really good financial marketer all within the regulations, all safely. Fantastic. That's good to know. I know a lot of people tuning into this will be great to know that. The popping back to the cultural bit a second, that I delivered some kind of uh, speaking academy style stuff to the next gen community in, well, there was a, a big old day that was Australia in the morning, South Africa lunchtime, US in the evening. What I loved was uh, from the US room, especially, there was, um, there was a real kind of quickness to be vulnerable. There was, and not just in the personal of sharing personal experiences, but even from a professional point of view, I just found it was a lot more more open. Now, you obviously have uh, people like the amazing Brenny Brown kind of leading the way with talking about vulnerability and stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel there's a huge need for more vulnerability in the industry um, to be able to really truly personally connect with not just people, but brands as well, it has to be said. How difficult do you find it working with clients and trying to get their story prized out of them? Because we're kind of working on the same kind of concept from two different angles, aren't we? We're trying to prize people's stories out of them and then helping them to become familiar and comfortable with sharing that with their audience. Yeah, this is actually a question. Um, you hit on two of the biggest questions that I get asked. Okay, cool. That was never so intentional. Great. Everything no, I do is no, by no, accident. <laughs> Um, so the, the second biggest question we get asked after compliance and regulation concerns is, okay, what is the line between personal and professional? Because we are always talking about authenticity and showing your values and being vulnerable. And so then the, the obvious next question is, okay, but when, where does that stop? I don't want to post my kids Saturday afternoon on LinkedIn. I don't want to post my intimate family dinner on LinkedIn. I don't want to post a video of like my dinner party on LinkedIn. Totally valid. Every, everyone is totally valid for what they're thinking. I completely understand that you don't want to post that. Um, so going back to your question, how have I found like getting these stories out of financial professionals? It is really an art. And I think that I wasn't prepared for how much pushback I would get, even though I worked in the industry. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's also a cultural thing. Um, and it's something that I, it took me leaving the US to really appreciate that about Americans. Um, because as you can imagine, when I'm here in Switzerland, I hear from so many people about the American cliches and stereotypes and things like that. And, you know, it's been, it's been a journey for me to be like, okay, I understand why you, you think that about us. And some, I'm like, yeah, there is some truth to that. And some, 
I have found pride in American stereotypes where I didn't even realize that like, this is something to be proud of, like Mm -hmm. being vulnerable and transparent and like getting to know someone like super quick. Right. And you can say that's a bad thing or, or a good thing. And I have found that it's more of a good thing for me. And I'm very proud of that. Um, But I think it helps that I'm also American because when you work with someone, you kind of can set the tone that someone matches you. So I can't come to someone and say, get, share me your deep, deepest, darkest secrets. Like, come on, share what, let's get personal. What, what's up? <laughs> um, but, you know, I love to really get to know people and hear their stories. And it's a process. I'm not going to ask on the first call, like, you know, what is your, what's the biggest challenge you've ever overcome in your life? That's a, that's a really heavy thing. We got to work up to that, right? Yep. But if I come in and I'm open about the challenges that I've overcome, then I find that it's easier for people to meet me there instead of asking something without giving it back, right? Yeah. So John, that's what I found. It's really interesting. Thank you for that. It's a great insight. It's interesting. The things that you felt you've had to defend or take on the chin or whatever you, kind of how you worded it, those are the things that I really wish were more prevalent this side of the pond that I actually there have been times especially recently that I felt more at home in the US audience than I have actually in my own audience which is really crazy because the that vulnerability angle and I think that's the problem I think that when in a culture that's used to more openness and greater vulnerability actually they know that vulnerability isn't sharing your kids pictures on LinkedIn vulnerability is just being able to say to somebody who's sharing with you I absolutely get that I've been there I feel that that's vulnerability that's vulnerability Uh, But I think that's the problem. We leap to extremes and we're not used to something, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. So what's next for you? What's what's, uh, what's a big plan? That is a good question. So I have not mentioned my incredible co-founder, Lona, but she's such an important part to my company and my journey and everything like that. And when you talk about, you know, getting vulnerable, um, I can definitely say that like currently what we are working on the most is our relationship between us as friends and co-founders. And we're trying to solidify that and get that to be stronger so that when our business grows, it's growing on a strong foundation rather than, you know, we didn't, we didn't quite realize how difficult it would be to balance the line between friendship and business partnership. Wow. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So that is currently where our sites are at is really like working on our relationship. And then in the future, um, we hope to make our kind of services more accessible and more flexible than an average marketing agency. So we don't want to come in and say, you need this, this, and this, and it's going to be a hundred thousand, whatever currency. Um, We want to come in and be able to help and really see differences and see the impact that we can make on, you know, smaller individual financial yep. companies or whether it's individual financial planner or just like a smaller company, we want to be able to be there for people. So with that, I think the only way forward is through, you know, digital services. So we're going to be creating more online courses and maybe kind of a way to work with people on a membership. Yes. So that people can get a chance to work with us, but it's not kind of locking them into a big contract. Um, and I know all of this stuff sounds like, you see so many digital courses and like online coaches and things like that. But I have realized just working, trying the traditional way and trying the online way that it actually helps people like clients more when it's online and it's more flexible than the other way around. Yeah, I think so. so. I I think especially in the kind of a more fluid kind of working day and uh, we can kind of shape our learning around our other commitments. I think that's a really powerful thing. So how did you guys get together? Where did this come from? Where, uh, how did you kind of be the co-founders? Yeah, so um, Lona was my very first friend in Switzerland. So after that Amazing. year- that's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. After that year of not having anyone to turn to to get a cup of coffee or anything like that, um, I met this guy at a, at a barbecue and he was asking me how I like Switzerland. And being the American that I am, I was very blunt and very honest with him. I said- you know, it would be great if I had a friend to share something with, but since I don't, it's not that great. (laughs) (laughs) And um, he was like, you know, you really remind me of my little brother's ex-girlfriend. You guys should meet. 
And I was like, okay, I'm open to anything. Like, hit me. And Lona and I met for coffee. And then we be quickly became friends. We actually share, I'm from Colorado in the US. And she so randomly went to university in Colorado in the US. Wow. So it's we crazy. share that connection. I love the synchronicity of the world. It can, it can it? very often align. <laughs> yeah. So Thanks. yeah, we, we became friends. And then um, she actually worked for the biggest marketing agency in Switzerland. So after that meeting, when I had three clients and no business, I called her up and I was like, Lona, I have three clients. I need marketing help. Do you want to start a business with me? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, sure. And we just kind of started this as like a little side gig. We never expected it to be something full-time or something really serious. And it just grew really organically from there. I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. So the question I ask everybody uh, is this. I'm going to set the scene for you. I'm now the MC of the O2 Arena in London. 20,000 people paid our hard-earned money to come and hear you speak because we haven't even talked about that. You are a speaker in your own right as well. I'm just about to announce you to the stage and your walk-on music kicks in. That song that motivates you, that gets your energy up, keeps you at peak state. What would the track be? You know, Nick, I've thought long and hard about this. And the song that keeps coming back to me is Independent Woman by Destiny's Child. And it's not because of, you know, that I, it, it's because I love this sense of like self-empowerment and what you can do for yourself and whatever you set your goal to be, you can achieve. And so I don't, I think that song is about a relationship or something, but I see it. I just want to explain. I see it more as just kind of like um, independent woman, man, whatever, you are in charge of your own life and you can hit any goal that you set for yourself. Love that. That's amazing. So independent woman. Great, great choice. And that track, along with everybody else from season two, is going to be on a playlist at the end of the season. Stay tuned for that. That's going to be really cool. But for now, please do connect. Please do reach out to Ali. She, I know she'll be delighted to hear from you. Ask for any questions. Her contact details and all the links are in the bio. Um, but for now, Ali Marchand, big round of applause. Thank you. Absolute star. Thank you so much for joining us on today's show. We really appreciate your time. Um, and for everybody else, stay tuned for the next episode of the Forge Ahead Show. We have some more amazing guests from all different walks of life coming your way. So please keep your eye out for the next episode, which is episode 11. I'm getting really good at this now. And I'll see you again soon. In the meantime, stay happy, stay well, and take care. See you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. A big thank you for tuning in to today's show. Please stay tuned and hit subscribe for future episodes, bringing you amazing guests, sharing amazing content and amazing insights. Really excited to bring you these. The Forge Ahead Show is sponsored by NickElston.com. If you want to connect with me, you can find all the ways possible through the website. If you want to drop me a message, always great to hear from you. But in the meantime, if I don't catch you before, I'll see you at the next episode. And you take care, guys. Cheers now. Bye. Bye-bye.